I want to return now to an issue we've been focused on quite a bit over the last five or so months since Labor's election loss. And as they await the outcome and the handover of the official party review into their election loss in the coming weeks, um, where did Labor get it wrong? Where does it go now? How does it reposition? Not just in detailed policies, but really in what it stands for and who it's trying to represent. A, a book that's being launched uh, tomorrow night, in fact, by Jim Chalmers, the Shadow Treasurer, called Getting the Blues, is written by the director of the John Curtin Research Centre, uh, the Labor think tank, uh, Nick Derenfirth. And he joins me now. Nick, thanks very much for your time this afternoon. You really cut to the chase here. You don't muck around about uh, where Labor's getting it wrong. Let me ask you, has Labor become too progressive as a party? Uh, in short, David, yes. Um, and I say this uh, as a member of the ALP for 21 years, uh, who's served in various uh, uh, capacities as a branch member, secretary of our National Policy Forum, as a staffer, as a proud trade unionist for 22 years. Um, Labor uh, is at a tipping point. Um, it, it is facing an existential crisis. Labor has won one out of the last nine elections with one draw. Its primary vote over the last three decades is on a clear downwards trajectory. Uh, it fell below 40% in 1990, has popped above 40% in 1993 and 2007. Funnily enough, when Labor campaigned not on progressive social issues but about issues to do with the economy, a regressive tax in the form of the GST in 1993 uh, and work choices in 2007. And the last three elections um, are devastating for Labor. Its primary vote um, has bounced between 33 and 34 per cent. It is impossible to form national government with the primary mired in the mid to low 30s. Now, I've written this book uh, as a proud Labourite, uh, from a position of love, but also anger. I was dismayed um, disappointed uh, and angered by what happened uh, on the 18th of May of this year. Um, not just because Labor lost, and I think there was a need for a strong, reforming, social democratic Labor government led by a fundamentally decent centre-left leader in the form of Bill Shorten. Um, it's because if you look at the coalition's record over the last six years, it's a dismal record. It has cy it's cycled through three Prime Ministers in around three and a half years. Um, it has done nothing to tackle the big issues confronting the Australian economy, now society. Nothing on record low wages growth, wages theft, insecure work and, and falling living standards. Nothing on the housing affordability crisis. Which, nothing in terms which, which of really Which Nick raises the question, in, in, in why... why why the coalition keeps winning and why Labor keeps losing, therefore. Uh, now, when, when you say Labor needs to reposition, is at a tipping point and it has become too progressive, does that really come down to issues like climate change and how much time and energy it's putting into and, and where it's positioning itself on that issue? Is it other, other you know, social policy issues like same-sex marriage and so on? What are the issues do you think Labor's getting at least the emphasis wrong on? I was about to get to energy and climate, and again, this, this government has taken six years to not even yet settle on a consistent policy, not just in terms of taking action on climate, but creating jobs, fostering new industries. Um, uh, but in terms of labour, yes, climate featured too prominently in the 2019 election, along with health, for that matter. Um, we were promised a referendum on wages, and Labor promised many sound, good, necessary economic reforms, but fundamentally it was not trusted to implement those reforms. And you have to ask yourself why. Why? Because enough voters in enough key seats in suburban and regional Australia were more concerned about their wages, their jobs and their industries. And frankly, much of the so-called progressive language that Labor used, particularly around climate, and that has continued in parts of the party and broader movement after the election, language such as the climate crisis, the climate emergency, scares working-class people, scares middle Australia. They hear the terms 
crisis, climate emergency, they hear, they hear phrases such as the Extinction Rebellion. And when they hear these phrases, they fear for their jobs. They fear for their workmates, they fear for their families, and they fear for the industries which sustain their jobs and their livelihoods. I mean, some in Labor would say, well, if they abandon the field on climate change or significantly water down their position, they're going to lose votes on the left, the Greens and so on. Is that a valid concern? It is, and I'm, I'm very pleased... I was very pleased uh, to, to hear Anthony Albanese's uh, headland speech yesterday, um, where he tied... Um, Labor's message and its plan for action on climate very strongly to job creation. And I think we need to hear a lot more um, from Labor uh, in that sphere. And I, I think we will hear a lot more from Labor uh, in, in coming weeks and months. Um, but, but the problem is about framing, it's about culture, it's about language. Um, Labor is now in uh, uh, as shockingly a sclerotic position as it was in the 1960s. Uh, in the 1960s, um, it was a party dominated um, by the blue-collar working class, which couldn't build um, the type of national majority you need to win federal government. So the party invested in recruiting um, middle-class professionals, white-collar workers. Gough Whitlam uh, embodied the injection of these people into the party and broader movement, and it was a terrific success. The problem for Labor in 2019 is the reverse scenario now applies. Labor is predominantly a party of the inner city, progressive middle class. So even when it has good, sound economic reforms, which it takes to an election, it is the values and the language and the culture which it projects to the electorate, which is the problem. Can I just turn to the suggestion you raise in the book that's, um, well, I certainly grabbed a fair bit of attention, some headlines, but uh, not necessarily a lot of support amongst elected Labor MPs right now. You've, you've talked about quotas. We have quotas for the number of women in the Labor Party, but you're saying quotas for working class uh, 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 Australians to be represented in Parliament. Too many former staffers, union officials, apparatchiks. Uh, I think there's 19 on the 22-member front bench that fit those categories. Explain to me your thinking on this. What, how would this work? Firstly, I come from a position of self-awareness. I'm a former staffer uh, and I've formerly worked uh, for a union. Uh, I think a working class quota is now absolutely essential to address uh, that imbalance in the party between the progressive inner city middle class uh, and um, outer suburban and regional Australia. Uh, my proposal... Uh, is that the quota should be based um, loosely on educational attainment, but it's not prescriptive. So I'd like to see more people who haven't necessarily finished uh, high school um, but undertook trades training uh, or, or young people uh, who didn't uh, graduate with a tertiary degree. And, David, that's 74% of the Australian population... Um, and I think if you, could, if you looked at uh, federal Labor's uh, representation, um, you'd find that 80 to 90 per cent of MPs would have a tertiary degree. Um, or at least um, uh, people, working class people who've attained a tertiary qualification after the age of 25. Um, but again, um, the definition is not meant to be watered, is not meant to be uh, prescriptive. Um, I would like to see Labor's ranks filled with the full diversity of working, of working life in Australia. I'd like to see more teachers, more accountants, more hairdressers, more miners, uh, more people who are working in our burgeoning uh, IT industry, um, more people who, have, who often have had a lived experience um, of economic insecurity uh, and have worked in mm. precarious, precarious fields. And quite frankly, David... Um, it, it has made people uncomfortable. And quite frankly, if the Labor Party is to renew and reform, the makeup of the Federal Party over the next two or three electoral cycles, the next decade, it will have to change. Some of the inner city, middle class, progressive MPs will have to go. Thank you very much for your service, but it's time to move on. We need to renew. Uh, and if people do come from that background, but first and foremost are concerned with the material circumstances uh, of working-class Australians, 
tackling big issues like economic insecurity, then they will need to leave their inner city middle class progressive views um, at the doorstep of Parliament House in Canberra. Well, it's a big challenge you lay down there for the party and it goes to really the structure of uh, how the party works and how people do end up being pre-selected to run for Parliament. Uh, and look, it's a very healthy debate, I, I guess, for the party to have right now. Nick Dierenfirth, really appreciate you uh, joining us. Well done on the book, Getting the Blues, a great title uh, when it comes to getting back those blue-collar workers uh, during a difficult time for the Labor Party. Appreciate your time. Thanks, David.